Hello everyone and welcome to episode 20 of the Nurtured by Nature podcast. Today I'm delighted to be joined in conversation by the inspiring Caroline Mason from Seeds to Thrive. During our beautiful conversation, we delved into the concept of regenerative farming from the perspective of food systems and how these regenerative systems can offer resilience to the unpredictability of our current climate. Despite the challenges of a society institutionalized to think and operate in silos, Caroline is passionate about viewing businesses as functioning ecosystems and helping them to create the space for collaborative thinking by empowering people to become curious and get involved in the co-creation of the solutions that need to be implemented. Together, we share our hope and excitement for the future by looking to the local heroes who have quietly been part of a growing grassroots movement that is not wasting time waiting for governmental directives to tackle the challenges our environment faces but simply getting on and implementing their own positive solutions to create a brighter future where both people and nature can thrive. Welcome Caroline and thank you so much for joining me today in conversation on this episode of the Nurtured by Nature podcast. It's really, really lovely to have you with with us today. Um, I know we've been friends for a long time, but you're, you've started on an exciting new journey recently. So I'm looking forward to hearing a bit more about that. I just start off my sessions with all my guests by just asking them a little bit about their nature story. So just how nature has been a part of your life and if that's evolved or you know changed over time. And just if you've got any nice memories about sort of the natural world that you'd like to share to start us off. No, well, thank you, Fiona. Um, It's lovely to see you and I'm delighted to be here. I think it's such a special podcast series that you're building with helping to raise awareness around nature and what it means to different people. So when you asked me, I, I jumped at the chance and nature for me is something that has always been part of my life. And that's because I grew up farming so I come back I come from a farming family um, in Shropshire so animals has always been a huge huge part of my life cattle sheep horses dogs Um, but the actual environment the soil the trees flowers birds is probably something that when you've grown up in a farming environment that's just your normal because (laughs) and particularly when you've lived somewhere that's fairly rural which I did you go to rural schools and you're surrounded by green greenness, which um, I am incredibly grateful for because nature can give you, if you allow it to, the most wonderful grounding and being able to be present with it. Um, but it can give you so much freedom and space as well by just being in it and hanging out with it. And that's probably what I remember the most about my brother, sister and I, because we're quite close, we're born three years and two months um, between us. And we would spend, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) so super close, but we would spend hours, we would go off for hours playing in the woods or in the fields. And mum would know that we would just come home when we got hungry. (laughs) (laughs) Brilliant. And that's oh, that fantastic. was just our, our normal. That was just how yeah. it worked. Um, and weekends were spent at my grandparents' farm, which is my mum's home. Um, and we were there helping out on the farm. And that was really normal for us to be able to be doing that on our weekends. Um, and then horses came into our world as well. So my sister and I, we both have horses and my mum has always had horses and that's how you and I met yeah um, so horses I mean I could we could probably railroad this podcast and, <laughs> and spend a lot of time talking about horses um but for me they are the way for me in which a horse connects with my soul and um has this wonderful ability to give forgiveness and to build trust with you and partnership and the way that they 
see and feel and interact with nature and how that impacts on their behaviors and how they feel safe or not safe or happy and excited and then you've got a human on top that's somehow trying to <laughs> embrace whatever it is that, that horse is doing at that one moment in time so I guess it's that combination that nature for me is more than the, the trees and the green environment is part of that but it is the animals yeah. that are interacting within that nature ecosystem that as I've got older and probably asked better questions and wanting to understand things it never ceases to amaze me every day the wonder of the interconnection and connectivity between nature both when it's thriving but also when it's broken yeah. and when it's got out of balance and how that impacts on crops that are growing for food animals for example, my one horse, he um, has developed allergies as he's got older, but our environment is changing and he's he's super sensitive. So there's just this always interesting dynamic that is going on between how we as humans are forever trying to adapt in an environment that's adapting, but our animals are equally doing the same, but actually nature kind of stands still. <laughs> And she just goes with the ebbs and flows and we just all try and find our way in the chaos. Um, and that's probably part of its beauty and its mystery as well at the same time. Yeah, it's, it is just, I loved what you shared there. It's amazing, it, the interconnectedness. And I think for horses, for me, they're also that kind of like, it's just this amazing connection to be mm -hmm. with an animal like that and have that kind of special, relationship with them isn't it it's just you feel just I don't know more part of of the environment I mean I've been lucky to do um some sort of horseback safaris in Africa and just I don't know being on a horse is just you feel more in part of the environment the wildlife responds to you in a very different way to if you're just a human there and um yeah so it is a, a very special Kind of gift i guess that we we've had in this world that the horses have have come into the world and they're prepared to be our partners and and kind of carry us around and and show us the world through their eyes absolutely yeah but um i think i loved um what you said about about farming and the the soils and things and i think that's becoming more and more important isn't it and mm -hmm. more recognized in mm -hmm. society is basically like we need to look after the soil and i think that's that's very important for farmers isn't it now it's becoming much more talked about and i guess that's part of the industry that you're involved in yeah definitely so i've been working across the food system for the last 17 years mainly in large corporate organizations um and retailers so i was at co-op latterly and i was head of agriculture fisheries and aquaculture there and i have also worked at waitrose um for five years and i worked in the fresh produce supply base in the early part of my career so I've been very fortunate to do a lot of global travel as well because the fresh produce industry and we import a lot and I spend a lot of time on the ground with growers. And also here in the UK, one, my upbringing and therefore the community that I'm part of, I've always been involved in farming. And then when I was doing the head of agri role at co-op, then I, my team and I, we were responsible for the welfare of the animals and the fish that are in our supply chains. But equally how we become more environmentally responsible with all of those ingredients that are part of making the food that you would see in the shop. But from an animal perspective and a protein perspective, there's the welfare of the animals. And then there's equally how we work with our farmers to look at how we're growing and feeding the animals and actually how we are bringing more knowledge and more expertise to upskill farmers ultimately to keep on I guess elevating the baseline from a performance perspective when we think about the environment animal welfare it's it's a given I mean how we look after our animals from a husbandry perspective that's been a 
that's just been part of the protecting of a of a retailer yeah. brand for, for a very long time. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. The conversation around the environment and how we grow our food in a way that is less intensive and less depleting of the soil, but is much more regenerative. And by being regenerative, that means we have to look at the whole farming system in a different way. And we have to think about that complete environment that is servicing nature and it is also producing food. And it all comes back to the health of your soils, exactly as you say. And it's, I tend to think of it like our own gut microbiome. Now, when we have a healthy gut microbiome, our bodies are working and it's in and it's interconnecting and it's digesting um, and our engine is is firing and all of the nutrients are able to get to where it needs to be around our bodies. And it's exactly the same with the soil in that if we feed and nurture the soil and we improve that ecosystem and all of the bacteria and the fungi that interact with each other in that connective in that connected way, over time, our, our soils start to improve in terms of their health. And that's what we mean by a more regenerative system. But to build that health of the soil, it means we have to think about the crops that we're growing. It means you have to think about the manures that we're putting in and being less reliant on artificial fertilizers. And we don't want to disturb that ground. We want to keep it as stable as we possibly can. So that means having less big heavy machinery going on it. And we have to think about the animals that we put on that land and how long they stay there so that they don't overgraze it. And then the plants are working super hard, hard to like recover themselves again after they've been depleted. So it's this, which is, it's very easy to think of things in boxes. And that's kind of how we've been programmed over yeah. the last 50 plus years. Yeah. Particularly when it comes to growing food, we were just told after the Second World War, go grow food as much as possible, as quickly as possible. And that's where the intensive farming systems that we're now going, hang on a minute, they're, they're really um, damaging to our environment, but we've still got to feed people. So we're in this really interesting phase of recognizing that food is a, is a part of what's got us to where we are today, but equally the food system is so important. Yeah for enabling us to restore that um, really precious holistic ecosystem and farmed environment. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, I'm glad you touched on the the fact that sort of it was around after the war, the world wars that we both kind of ended up with the system that we've, we've come to have today. And, um, and that, you know, that you can understand the basis of that, you know, you've just been through these, these massive world wars, you know, people are, you know, you've, you've got to feed people, everything's been, you know, massively destroyed, countries are struggling, people are struggling, and you can understand how we started on that trajectory. Mm -hmm. And I think now it's, it's getting to this stage where we've, we've been following this path for, I guess, what, 80, you know, going on a hundred yeah. years and now, and obviously we've got a huge growing global population as well in that time. And now we're sort of starting to go, oh, hang on a minute. Actually, some of the choices that we've been making have been harming more good than they've been doing. Yes. And, and it's, it's twofold, isn't it? Because it's also while we're harming the environment, we're also harming ourselves. You know, there's a lot of links between the health of of the current you know global population and also the food that we're providing to them so by taking this more regenerative approach we are able to sort of you know twofold hopefully improve people's health you know you mentioned allergies with your horses you know the prevalence of cancers and things like that that you know by nurturing our, our soils more nurturing our food system is actually like one of the keystone foundations that we need to address that will have this massive ripple effect not just for environmental biodiversity but also our our own well-being and i i would get very excited about this subject so you can probably tell <laughs> it's, it's um, perhaps not it's something that a lot of people overlook which i think is sad but it, it can have such a huge benefit 
Um, and I think it's also quite topical at the moment, isn't it, with the biodiversity crisis that's really been highlighted in the recent sort of COP summits with the the UN. Yes. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's so you're so you're involved with with farmers, aren't you, basically, and and sort of or like food producers, should we say, and the the sort of supply yeah. chain. Yeah, exactly that. So the food, the food supply chain in its very simplistic terms if we think you have a retailer you have a supplier who's doing the manufacturing in the middle and then you've got the producer at the start of that that chain when we think about a food system that supply chain is obviously a really big part of it but it's all of the other businesses and organizations that are involved in that total food system and that is government it's yeah. citizens it's businesses it's farmers and producers it's it's a global network as well of, of people it's academia um it's veterinary it's there's so many facets that is involved within that food system and so within my time of working across the food system within the different roles that I've done one way or another you're interacting with lots of different stakeholders for want of a better word because if you're working for a retailer for example we have commitments that we've made for example reducing our our emissions in our yeah. food supply chain but we can't do that on our own so we need to work with all of these other parts of that food system to enable our to enable co-op when I was there to um, progress with reducing their emissions impact and again we're in another interesting dynamic because the policy direction that we're getting from government and lack of a national food strategy and there's a lot of changes in the farm payment system there's a lot of uncertainty there and then businesses particularly food businesses we've had Brexit we've had the pandemic we've had the war in Ukraine we're in inflationary pressures and consumers are asking a lot more questions about their food, but their, their purses are forever squeezed. So there's this real cocktail mix of um, macro factors that are, are impacting that complete food system. And then we've got consumers, rightly so, asking much more questions. So it, in amongst all of that noise, I think where one of the biggest places to have um, an impact actually is business, because fundamentally businesses, whether you're a food manufacturer, you're a retailer, um, you're a, a, a sandwich shop on a, on a high street, you have the, the, just this, in absence of, I guess, clear direction from government, it comes back to well, what actually what can I control within my yeah. business and the supply chains and the choices that I choose to make as a business and that for me is like the the yeah. sweet spot of um where we can actually progress yeah, faster think, in this I space th i think that's that's the thing isn't it i think um for a long time we've been waiting for the direction from government international bodies and it's not been forthcoming and i think um but there is, like you said, the consumers are starting to ask more questions and therefore there is a place actually that you can have this sort of almost grassroots movement that the government yes. will almost like their, you know, any directives that they put into place will almost be sort of secondary because it will already have happened. It will be sort of guided by the movement that has already been established rather than creating the movement and i think that's quite an ex it's quite exciting isn't it and i can imagine like the sort of industry that you're in is it's quite an exciting time although there's a lot of challenges and there's no easy solution yeah. but it's actually yeah. quite exciting to be like you can be on the forefront of of guiding these changes and almost in a way i guess um advising governments of of what works and what doesn't work there is definitely this really interesting dynamic of a balance of science and a needing science to be supporting us in our decision making processes. But there's also practical application. And, and this is something that I'm seeing that more and more farmers and food producers in, in this country are actually just grabbing hold of 
so thinking in a more regenerative way and they're just going for it and they're and they're doing it so you can science is great because it gives us things that are measurable tangible it's it's database it's research based but we also have to have better hang on a minute it needs to be practically applicable and needs to be something that can be rolled out across for as many people as possible and that's where with our landscape which is so diverse in this country one 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 system isn't going to suit everybody and it's and it's taking from the science and learning from others and going actually within within my farmed environment my area that i'm i'm looking after what would optimize my production both from a food perspective but also grow my my nature capital on my yeah. land yeah. and that like that you can't be prescriptive with that <laughs> But we need a combination of um, the both and then ultimately a support mechanism financially yeah. from government when when they work through how they're going to do that, that helps to accelerate that. Yeah, because they um, for people that perhaps don't know much about farming, um, we when we were in the EU, I don't know if you want to, we had basically these subsidies that sort of. I guess in a way at the, at the time often just rewarded farmers for having farmland in production um and you know now we we've moved away from being in the EU we're we're trying to find our we're, we're trying to find our way through it aren't we basically and <laughs> one of the conversations at its heart is looking at a way to be more prescriptive of rewarding farmers for being able to enhance biodiversity um you know sort of like you were saying like you know sort of almost like a nature bank basically it's like if they yeah. put you know more nature credits in then they get um rewarded from the money that is available for for these land-based systems um and yeah it's i mean it, it it goes back to what you were talking about about basically like your experience of nature in your childhood and, and growing up in farming is this interconnectedness and i think mm -hmm that's that's what we're trying to find our way through isn't it is basically everything is connected there's no you can't separate one thing from another mm -hmm. and it's these farmers are and and i love that this is this is something i love to share is like there are people out there doing these amazing things and yeah, you know there really yeah. are that there's this whole movement that is happening across the country that there are people who are already on this bus <laughs> Yeah. And there's some that have been on this bus for 30 plus years. Yeah. And 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 now there is more openness coming through, um, particularly with the more, I guess, younger generations that are thinking about things in a different way and perhaps more open to change yeah. to try these new ways of working with each other as well as looking at their farming system in a in a different way to perhaps what they've been mandated to up until now because yeah. of the payment system that we had when we were in Europe, which you're absolutely right. It, you were rewarded based on the acreage of land that you got and how much you were producing off that land. You said something about uh, basically you, you help businesses and I think you touched on like basically helping businesses to thrive and i don't think we can underestimate that the impact of that enough because basically if a business is thriving they have the ability to be sort of you know more experimental you know they can take risks they can you know invest more money and they can follow these you know new paths they can be the pathfinders really can't they and I think that's why it's really important what you're doing in supporting these businesses to kind of find their way to move forward successfully so that they can have a greater impact and yes. make bigger changes basically yeah what um so one of my big huge big observations after I stepped out of the corporate world last year was often businesses have either got a strategy that is, is a visionary strategy that's taken them to 2030. And then they have teams of people and layers across their business. And depending on what your role is, if you're 
a more sustainability focused department because that's your role then you're fully embedded in that in that vision and that direction other departments sustainability might not be part of their role and their title so there's this disconnect between the actual vision of where we're trying to get to but everybody in that organization actually truly understanding that okay. um and the way that our economy is at the moment mainly because of all of the factors i.e war in ukraine inflation brexit yeah. covid cost of living has gone up so the ability to invest back in these things is really hard so there's lots of short-term decisions that are being made basically to help keep costs down so yeah. that you can remain competitive which is okay in the sense of you're surviving right now but if we think actually well we have a greater responsibility yeah. to stabilize our planet and to keep our emissions down so that we do not heat below, but above 1.5 degrees but it's a really hard dynamic mm -hmm. when you've got those commercial day-to-day -day pressures to deliver against yeah. you set these really big far-reaching targets and there's this massive void in between but what I have observed is that actually often teams who are the ones that need to do that delivery, it's how you engage them in that strategy and in that vision so that they become empowered and more part of the co-creation of how we actually go about delivering those commitments. And that's where I'm working with clients and looking to grow the types of corporate businesses that I work with because for me I am super passionate about let's stop talking about stuff yeah, yeah. <laughs> and let's just do like yeah. let's just go for it and and we have our plans and we we do our risk assessment and we're obviously not um reckless with our decisions but fundamentally we, we've got a direction of travel let's just go make stuff happen and yeah, start so much taking time, some steps yeah. yeah yeah so much time is is lost to continual conversation around a table um and so working with businesses that are going right we really need to make progress and start moving on this stuff um they're they're like they're the superchargers they're the, the ones that give me a fire in my belly and I want to work with yeah and and they're the I think that's the thing isn't it there are more and more people out there and not business owners as well as consumers who are wanting to see action being taken and they're feeling this like sort of pent-up frustration that you know we're, we're still talking you know and the, all these international leaders are going to these you know international conferences and they're having another conversation and we're like we're like okay that we've been doing that for decades now like now, yes. now we want to actually start seeing some some impacts and i mean they've they put some pretty big stuff on the table. I think the end of last year in in COP fifteen in Montreal with yes. like the thirty yes. percent by twenty thirty yes. and yeah. um, halving. I think such... halving food waste as well, um, which is I guess it interplays into your industry as well. And um, yes. yeah, but it's it's like there's there's no real concrete <laughs> concrete examples of how they're going to make this happen is there and and that's why you need people like you and the organizations you're working with to yes. start finding those steps basically that then others can can replicate and and follow suit definitely and it, it was such a monumental moment at cop 15 in december because to have 195 countries actually sign up and commit to 30% of land and oceans to be conserved by 2030, well, that's their commitment that they made. I mean, that's a phenomenal step forward to actually have had alignment on a commitment. And you're absolutely right, Fiona, how we go about doing that and then how we measure that impact and how we play this really difficult dynamic of working through the unintended consequences as well and so that's where within our actions and our activities that we do we have to really care and want to understand if I do x over here what does it mean for y and I think sometimes that can also be overlooked because you can get very 
hankered just on one measure or one metrics as a as an output delivery but it's also understanding the ripple effect of that across that full food system ecosystem and some of that we won't know and so it's a case yeah. of understanding what that potential risk could be and with the way that the climate is changing and we're seeing more extremes more floods more droughts that throws a very interesting dynamic because that makes it really hard for our crops to be able to grow yeah. it makes yeah. it really hard for the food producer to understand how they adjust their farm system in absence of not having clear seasons anymore um yeah. it, it, it is so that i mean i've noticed i mean i obviously got horses i'm like you rural environment grew up outside you know very much sort of like aware of how seasons feel to you almost like you know you sort of yeah. you know at the moment i'm like oh my god it just feels like this doesn't feel like february to me i'm like i'm standing mm -hmm. outside and i'm like you know listening to how the birds are reacting looking at the trees the plants the you know the sort of sensation the warmth in the air the kind of moisture content and things and and i'm like this feels like we're further into spring than like the calendar yes. says we are and it, and it and it is it's, it's very hard for you know we we have these sort of perceptions of where you know when sowing should happen and you know when the plants are growing and when you can harvest and etc cetera, etc cetera. and yeah we have, i mean even in the uk which we're quite lucky that our our climate is fairly non-extreme isn't it really in in the the scale of things but i mean last year we had a, just an extended drought for a, a huge amount of time 40 degree temperatures which are almost unheard of we've you know equally had quite a, a nice winter in in some respects haven't we that we've actually had you know cold that, that we would expect and but yeah, it is incredibly hard. And, and that's things that people can't necessarily mit mitigate against, um, which adds to their their difficulties, doesn't it? In how they move through these challenges that they're facing. Yeah, d definitely. Um, and if I come back to regenerative systems and therefore you're building more resilience in your in your ground and in your soil, while we are having these extremes in the weather it fundamentally means that that environment below the soil has actually got much more stability and it's got much more nutrient within that soil to actually help capture water when we get excessive yeah. rainfall when we get excessive temperatures well actually those plants that have been planted have got really deep roots so they can seek down further to get water so but that is a that's quite a mindset shift in terms of thinking about how my field looks today and how I want it to, to adapt to actually be able to cope with those more um challenging environmental conditions because that whether we like it or not until our planet gets more stabilized and we do accelerate and keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees that is our norm as much yeah. as we might try and um not want to hear that or to face into that accepting the fact that uncertainty is our norm yeah. is the reality of where we're at and therefore it's like roll your sleeves up right yeah okay it's it's a challenge it's a huge challenge but there are masses of opportunity within that as well to make businesses be more resilient more innovative ask better questions think about the technologies that they use that ultimately means that they will become more efficient in the future which then ultimately means that they will be more regenerative and more restorative in everything that they do in their business organization that's that's like that's the picture isn't it but yeah. hard to see that when you're in the commercial pressures of the day-to-day -day, um business I think, um, I mean, obviously, you know, part of my background is like sort of creativity and artists and stuff. And I have some interesting conversation with other artists about actually the role that us as creatives need to play because we're we're the people that can 
look at sets of data and things and sort of think outside the box and see things in in these alternative ways that perhaps people who are a little bit more indoctrinated into this is how things are done or you know com completely science-based systems don't perhaps have that that way of seeing this vision and and I sort of I feel like that's a little bit what your business is is as well you're like you've got all of this wealth of understanding you understand like the science and you you know the practicality of having been on the farm and being on the ground but you have this sort of creative connection as well where you can sort of step back a little bit and you can say well hang on a minute yeah we've got all of these things but let's think of of different ways that we can do things and and then we just need to try them out and then we just need to have the science that comes along with us and goes okay well we've tried this and it improved this but this didn't quite go the way we expected and it's it's about everything working together isn't it is nothing is yeah. is better you know science isn't better creativity isn't better but you yeah. all it's a time that we need to all come together and recognize each other's uh, talents and contributions and have these conversations to build this kind of greater future for us all really it, it absolutely is Fiona and um, I could not agree more with what you've just said there because we've been institutionalized to think in silos and and that actually is a as a cultural way that our society works and so now we're we're needing to ask bigger and better questions but we're also needing to embrace the fact that I've got my expertise here but that scientist or that person over there, they've also got their expertise. Now, when we bring them together, yeah. <laughs> well, we might not necessarily always uh, agree, but if we agree when we get to a bit of a conflict point, well, we work through that because actually we're all brought into wanting to step forward and wanting to move forward and not have barriers blocking us in terms of making progress. And what I think needs to shift and happen across society is more people opening that space for collaborative thinking yeah definitely. and that's where I think of businesses as businesses as ecosystems okay I love that yeah 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 that's that's um that's really powerful yeah <laughs> yeah it's I think um I mean it's it it is isn't it it's it's about seeing this how everything is a reflection of everything else, isn't it? And like, you know, we have, you know, if someone says to you ecosystem, you know, we're listening to a, a nature podcast, we, we're probably going to be thinking about insects and, and plants and, but it's, you know, we're, we're part of that ecosystem as well. I think that's something else that, that people forget is, and, and sometimes we have a tendency to sort of position ourselves as the evil part of the ecosystem as well that you know the solution is to remove remove humans from the equation and actually we need to step into our part of the ecosystem and realize that we can be a force for good as well and we can you know help make you know make these choices make these changes and I just find it really exciting. I find it exciting talking to people like you, knowing that that you're out there, and knowing that you're in touch with, you know, these these amazing organisations, these farmers, these grassroots people who are excited to do this. And I think we don't we don't hear enough about them. You know, these these sort of like almost local heroes, aren't they? Really, in a way, um, that they're um, out there. There is so many local heroes uh, across the country who are just who are just following their hearts and their passions to want to make a difference and to take action and finding people who share that commonality with them and that can be within an organization that can be within your local community there is so many movements that are happening across the country be it people setting up food hubs to support food waste where there's food waste and that's based on volunteers whether it is people having allotments and having communities where they're sharing and growing food with each other or where it is businesses that are stepping up and taking more responsibility and culturally shifting how they think and operate within their full business and how they're empowering people to be to come forward with the ideas and the solutions and to work together and to challenge the culture and the thinking. So there's 
this there's this whole shift of activities that are, are happening at a micro level as well as a macro level and i think for me um i'm driven by aligning with people that share that level of enthusiasm and curiosity i think curiosity is a really key word in this because if you're curious to want to learn more and want to learn, understand more but curious to go oh well i spoke to that person over there and they're doing that and actually that person over there is doing this but let's just bring them together and let's turn those conversations that were happening there make them more powerful and then let's go do stuff yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's go make it happen and I think that's where we have had that curiosity taken from us just because we've been institutionalized into boxes that doesn't that almost shuts that curiosity away um that's the big part that will help us move forward is inspiring that human curiosity combined with what actually matters to you and what you love yeah yeah I, th I think that's um I love that so we, we've got quite a collection of C's going on haven't we? we've got curiosity and collaboration and <laughs> it's uh, it, it is it's um it's not I think I think sometimes we fall into this trap of expecting things to be easy don't we and I think that's that's something that we we need to just accept it it's not going to be easy we, we've got to you know take some big steps and make some big changes and it's it's not going to be easy but there are there are solutions out there there are people who are taking the first steps there are the pioneers that you mentioned who have been doing things quietly in the background just getting on with it sometimes they've been bullied and ridiculed and ostracized from the, the mainstream because they were a bit quirky and a bit different, but they have, they can now step into their own. And we've got, thanks to them, like sometimes decades and decades and decades of, of information and knowledge that we can actually draw on um, to move forward with, which is incredible. And I mean, I, I don't know if you've got any sort of um, people that you, you find particularly inspiring that you would like to share with people. Oh gosh, Fiona. <laughs> well, I listen to all sorts of different things. Um, but I actually, which is nothing to do with nature, um, her, a lady called Bernie Brown from America, who um, she's a behavioral scientist and, and researcher, but I, I am fascinated by us as human beings and how we behave and how we think um so she's somebody who I love listening to her podcast series she's got one called unlocking us and another one called um dare to lead and the way that she uses research in terms of understanding human behaviors and we have 78 different emotions that go on in our body 78 <laughs> I couldn't name I couldn't tell you nothing <laughs> like the 78 different emotions that would go on in in my body but just think of all of that that's going on in your body, even before you start throwing all the external stuff that comes at us on a day to day basis. So the I am super curious to understand how do I chase my best self and how do I become that wholly connected head, heart, mind, spirit person? Because if the more connected I can be with myself, the more love and kindness I've got to give to others to actually help with some of these big challenges because actually I've got really clear on on who I am and what I stand for and I've learned how to work with the tools that I was given i.e head heart yeah. gut spirit yeah and then but that's that's not gonna not everybody's going to want to learn about that stuff and that and that's okay um so Bernie Brown is definitely a standout person for me. And then this is one for horsey folk. Um, there's a chap called Warren um, Schillick from America. I follow his podcast series called um, The Journey On Podcast. And then I guess from a food and farming perspective, um, I just I more follow um, like newsletters that come through. So I, I've signed to eddie.net. I'm a member of the Grocer magazine. I get the um, Farmer's Guardian each week. So I I tend to use publications for the more industry trade updates and then 
podcast series that more um grow my curiosity in terms of us as a human being um because yeah. for me you need a combination of both I think um when you're talking about Brené Brown as well it's um the thing that sort of popped into my head was about um coming at people with compassion and a lack of judgment as well and I think you know there there is this tendency to sort of be quite judgmental and be like you know and we've all made mistakes haven't we basically it's like we've all we've all been on this journey and we got to this point together and blaming each other and judging each other is isn't going to get us out of this this place and actually you know bringing compassion and letting go of judgment and being like you know i don't expect you to have been perfect like you know we're starting from today and we're moving forward i think is really key for all of us at this point and um and i love the fact that you know that there's people like you that are coming into the industry and you're bringing all of these you know unique perspectives like brene brown which you know let's be honest the average farmer probably isn't gonna have, have listened to <laughs> but but by working with you they're they're getting that sort of you know result by osmosis aren't they almost <laughs> i love that yeah and i i bring that into my work with businesses as well um because it's that real because you've had so much uncertainty over the last four years and it's really taken its tolls on everybody as, a, as an individual covid and how we were disconnected from people and each other at, the virtual screen played a role, but nothing can replace human to human interaction. And so there's still an awful lot of that, that people are finding their way in this new world that is equally uncertain. Yeah. And, and so that that's where for me being somebody who I guess puts a bit of an arm around people and a team that empowers them and, coaches or uses simple frameworks that enable them to move forward and to deliver whatever their their roadmap of goals is that they're working on but absolutely you're right Fiona bringing in that personal element because we are all humans <laughs> and bringing a balance of that femininity and masculinity in the way that we go about getting things done often just gets lost in the ether of targets and just getting stuff done yeah yeah I think it's it's a really important um perception to have isn't it to bring that I think and we've touched on it indirectly quite a few times through this conversation this sort of more feminine um I don't, I don't want to say emotions that's not quite right but sort of um influences I suppose is probably a better word yeah. for it you know the sort of touch of creativity and intuition a sort of yeah. more collaborative you know community based a lot of those are, are more sort of feminine traits not to say that men don't have them at all because in terms of feminine and masculine we all have both yes. and we all have yes. access to both and it's about all of us being in balance you know you can have a two yeah. feminine woman as much as you can have a two masculine man and vice versa and um i think it 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 is great to see that you know there is i we're in the uk we're, we're particularly lucky that we have some amazingly strong female voices coming through in, in all of these areas and and um industries that probably were predominantly mostly sort of male mm -hmm orientated um you know farming is is at its heart would have predominantly been quite a masculine industry over well since the industrialization i suppose i mean going back if you look at indigenous cultures actually a lot of women were involved in in the sort of food production weren't they um so it's interesting i like to see how like these cycles are coming around and i think we're also drawing on this sort of almost indigenous knowledge aren't we we're going back to sort of ancestral roots and what was done historically and but bringing a modern touch to it as well the the advances of science have their place to play to help us do those those things better as well absolutely fiona it's these are 
all leadership. These are all ways of being that to grow that healthy functioning society that we need, we need a combination of both the masculine and the feminine and an appreciation of both and the importance for our human happiness that we have that balance and that businesses are my hope is that over the coming years there will be more openness and awareness of actually the two is wholly possible to achieve and you can be commercially successful and you can deliver on your sustainability and climate commitments because if we have that human balance of the masculine the feminine and and people um self-caring for themselves in terms of their well-being and looking after them people are happier therefore they're hopefully going to be more happier and more thriving in their work which just organically means that a business is is thriving and growing and being more resilient that will take time and it takes and it takes businesses and it takes individuals to effectively speak in that way yeah it, it does it it does take um and courage as well another th- c let's throw, let's let's throw another c in there for today <laughs> caroline and her I, I don't know what are we up to three c's or something <laughs> but it, it is it it is that's what we need now isn't it we need people who are are courageous and are prepared to step outside the box and take the rest of us along for the ride really yeah it's like this is a really cool bus over here this, would you like to come on yeah <laughs> we don't know where we're going <laughs> it's real fun <laughs> but we've got that we've got the vision of where we want to go <laughs> we've got this vision of where we're going we don't quite know how we're going to get there we know why we need to get there but let's let's just go let's just go make stuff happen um yeah. and that that for me is like that's the really cool thing here Fiona and I can give you I think we're up to so we've had courage we've had compassion collaboration um (laughs) collaboration I'll give you a fourth one communication perfect (laughs) especially on a podcast (laughs) oh well I it's been amazing talking to you, Caroline today. Um, I think we're sort of getting to a point where it's sort of a good place to start wrapping up. I don't know. We did touch a little bit before we we started recording on um, like the importance of hope, and I don't know if you just want to share a little bit about what makes you feel hopeful for the future. Oh, what a beautiful question, Fiona. Thank you. It's actually quite simple. It's just about hanging out with people who seem to speak your language, who make you feel good when you've had a conversation with them, who say, hey, I've got your back as well. I'm finding this hard too, but hey, how about we hold hands (laughs) and try and navigate it together? And that is what gives me hope, is that there are people out there who will be thinking and feeling the same as you, And the more you speak of that and the more you search and reach out to find people who share that vibration and that energy with you and the words that they use, that's what gives me hope because you're in the same tribe and you're on the bus together. (laughs) Oh, that is, that's brilliant. I love that. And it's a pretty cool bus. And, you know, I think Caroline and I are both on it. (laughs) So, and we'd like you to join us um I just want to just make sure that I shared your business name properly so that everyone's got that so your business is Seeds to Thrive is that right yeah that's right so Seeds to Thrive Experts in Sustainability and we are about supporting businesses and people to accelerate on their sustainability ambitions and dreams and working with teams like really importantly it's actually about empowering the people um within organizations to actually make progress and to have structures in their activities um and somebody who's their accountability buddy that says hey i've got you on this and i'm in this with you as well and i'm I'm coaching you and i'm working with you because i want to see you succeed and to to deliver against your dreams and ambitions and that's fundamentally Fiona what Seeds to Thrive is about 
taking those little seeds, nurturing them, giving them the environment that you need as an individual. And when you do that and you give the right environment to an individual within a system, whatever that is, whether that is a carrot that you're growing or whether it is people in an organization, when you're nurtured as, a, as an individual and you're given the right environment and the right tools to grow, you will thrive. And that's, that's what it's about. Oh, brilliant. And that's what we need. We need people thriving and we need nature thriving. And then the future looks brighter, doesn't it? Sure does, on our bus. <laughs> oh, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Caroline. It's been absolutely fantastic talking to you today. Uh, just really fascinating conversation. And, um, well, hopefully we'll uh, get to do it again sometime. Maybe we, we can catch up and, and see how, uh, how your business has developed and we can talk more about you know, the advances in, in farming and things like that that we see over the next year or so. Sounds great, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Nurtured by Nature podcast. I truly hope this conversation has brought some hope and inspiration into your life. I would love to have these messages ripple out across the world. So if you can, please share this episode with your friends, leave a review on your favourite podcast player and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. I would love to hear from you, so please feel free to connect with me on the links provided in the podcast description. But most importantly, thank you so much for being a part of this journey with me. But don't forget to simply get out there and enjoy the natural world. <laughs>